Okay, today on the bench we have a, uh, this was given to me. I just wanted to see how this, how well this thing worked. What we have is a Bud Radio Incorporated model LF-601 variable low pass filter. Um, what makes this kind of odd, or I don't want to say odd, but you almost unique and um, also expensive by today's standards if it was made is the variable part. Most of your low-pass filters you see today are going to look almost exactly like this, minus these five controls, which are variable capacitors. It's just going to be a metal box, coax in, coax out, and some coils inside. And that's pretty much <laughs> the extent of a low-pass filter. Uh, this one's adjustable. Um, now it has variable impedance at the input and the output. I'm not sure why it has a, a second variable impedance at the output side but then it has like I say this blow pass filter especially back in the day before especially before digital television um, you know the TV band was very susceptible and especially these channels from 2 to channel 6 2 to 4 being the worst especially for uh, people with uh, CB radios they were a lot of them people tinkering with them would be known to be splatter boxes so, uh, you know, hooking up one of these in, in line to your antenna was a great way of, you know, keeping your neighbors happy. So, I want to see how effective this thing is. So, I currently have it hooked up to the spectrum analyzer over there, which has a tracking generator. And it's hooked up the, to the tracking generator. So, what I want to do is, is kind of get this set so you can see... Leave myself a little bit of room here to actually get in here so you can see me tuning it and see exactly see exactly what it does on the screen. So you know we can go like channel the two two through four. Yeah, it's affecting it some. The four. Oh man, yeah, you can really I hadn't actually played with this yet, so yeah, man, you can really... So you almost need a spectrum analyzer to set this thing. Oh, holy crap, yeah. And you get into that, that first variable impedance on the output side. Woo! Boy, you can really throw this thing out of kilter. <laughs> oh my god, look at that. Yeah, man, you can really... Let's try and get her back. Actually, it looks like it was fairly good before where it was at originally. Now, currently I have, uh, let me set it down here. I have the span start frequency is 20 megahertz, stop frequency is 100. So, left side of the screen is 20, right side of the screen is 100 megahertz. I have a marker set that eh, we can move that over because most people would be using this. Well, let's. Yeah, I guess I could say 30 megahertz. Okay, so right there is the marker. It's right there, right underneath the what? One, two, third zero. I can see the little dot there. So we want to have minimum amount of effect there but maximum over here and I can see there it is dipped down not much it's being fed a uh, this is currently being fed out of the tracking generator a minus 20 dBm signal so it's only down a half a dBm but there we go oh man it's oh Damn near perfect. That looks really good right there. Yeah, at that setting, now I'm just curious. Uh, let's see. Frequency. I'm just going to go out to 
Let's see, stop frequency one. The maximum bandwidth of the spectrum analyzer, which is 1.5 gigahertz. Woo, boy, it doesn't do anything for the higher frequencies, does it? <laughs> Got some nasty spikes out there. <laughs> uh, I just put the marker back on. It really starts to drop off at let's say, or actually the spikes start to come up. So it's effective. It looks like about to uh, what 283. I just might as well say 280. 90 maybe yeah say 290 megahertz about yeah I have, hold on a second it just went into calibrate mode okay now it's back to refreshing so yeah it looks like it's good to say 290 megahertz and then yeah it gets a big peak first one's at 350 365 Actually, this used a peak function. Let's see, peak. Okay. So yeah, it's got a peak at 365, 340, or 459, 565, 676, 779. You can see, I don't have to read them off. But even out at the, this le these levels, you know. The least amount of attenuation is at almost, say, 780 megahertz, with 779. You know, it's only down 6 d, you know, down 6 dBm. But uh, you know, once you get, like I say, so it looks like it's it's effective to say right around 300 megahertz. And yeah, there's 301. It's at minus, say, 60 dBm or a little bit less. So it's down, down right there. Let's put the stop frequency back at 100. Oh, well, actually, let's do it at uh, let's try 60. And we'll make start. Say twenty-five. Stop. I just want to see how sharply this drops off, just narrowing it down a little bit more. Yeah, we're still fairly flat, right about to that point. So right at about, say, 36, 37 megahertz is where it starts to drop off. So let's set the start at 35. And... Ah, yeah, crap. Try it again. I had returned the marker back on there. Marker... And we're definitely down in the mud there, so let's say 50. So we'll set the stop frequency at 50. That's pretty much what it looks like. So there's from basically no attenuation to full attenuation right around right there. Right about 47 megahertz. Just about reaching maximum attenuation and it's down 50 plus dBm right there so not bad fairly impressive for a for that little guy definitely we'll uh, have to think about putting this guy into use now if you're interested to see what's inside I did take the you know, all it has is four screws two on each end but what's inside should be no surprise. Just five air variable capacitors and some coils. Um, 
but as you can tell built back in the day good heavy duty unit you know ceramic insulators on the air variable caps hmm, look at that actually all almost all of these that one's almost fully meshed that's that's damn close to fully meshed and so is that one so actually it worked out to where where I had that or still have that on the analyzer if they're all all those are fairly close to being fully meshed but uh, I'd be interested to know what the original uh, it wouldn't matter for CB but you know if you wanted to use with with your ham radio I'd be interested to know um, if anybody has any original literature on this what these were rated at for power uh, just judging by the components I'm I guess this thing could handle a thousand watts probably I would think I guess the only lim the biggest limiting factor would be maybe the caps are well no they're not actually going to have that much energy on them I guess the wire so hell it's probably good for over a thousand watts and actually speaking of that you can see how everything in here is nice copper color look at that coil it looks like that's been overheated at one time. You can tell when copper gets hot, it starts to get a darkish omen, and it starts like a sil grayish silver color to it. Looks like the coil got hot right there at one point in time. So somebody was probably pumping some juice through this thing. <laughs> and honestly, that'd probably be the easiest way to tell what its power handling capacity is, would be to just, you know, hook it up to, you know, my Kenwood... Or my Yezu and you know just hook it up through my Yezu amplifier and uh, start cranking the power up and and then monitor this with a thermal imaging camera and actually see at what point does this thing start to have noticeable temperature rise and you know then figure you're going to drop down from that be this this safe area. But like I said, I'd just be curious to know what uh, Bud originally rated these things at. But in any case, there you go. The Bud LF601 variable low pass filter, my opinion, looks to be a good working filter. So, I'll, like I said, I'm probably actually going to use this. Um, this might replace a MFJ I actually have currently in line. I really like the uh, variability on this thing. So, there you go.